Right, so here we are wrapping up the book of Joshua. And it's a pretty good wrap-up chapter. This is, it really ties a lot of things together here. And a brief overview here, we see that Joshua, um, he gets all the tribes together. Look at verse number one there. It says, And Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem, and called for the elders of Israel, and for their heads, and for their judges, and for their officers, and they presented themselves before God. So he's mainly speaking here to the rulers, the leaders, the, the officers, the people who are kind of in charge over Israel, just by and large, many people who are holding offices over the people, over the people of the land. And he, he gathers them all together, and he starts giving them kind of like this history lesson, a brief history lesson, going back to Abraham, and then leading up until where they are right now and just highlighting everything that you know everything that's happened along the way and all the things that god has blessed them with and that god has led them and brought them to this point and then just brings them to the decision point and says okay here we are you know you've got the inheritance god delivered your enemies for you here's the land choose who you're going to serve right and, and he kind of leaves it at that he leaves it up to them and says, well i know what i'm going to do you know you guys decide what you're going to do and then, of course, it wraps up with um, Joshua dying and then multiple people who were, you know, pillars in the faith at that time, you know, kind of wrapping up their life in the book of Joshua. So let's, let's keep reading here in verse number two. The Bible says, And Joshua said unto all the people, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel. So right here, we're starting with God's words, right? Like literally saying, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel. So now it's going to be speaking in the first person, like coming from God. Your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in old time, even Terah, the father of Abraham and the father of Nacor, and they served other gods. Now, before I get any further, I just want to explain this. If it's not already obvious from the context, I don't want you getting confused when it says the flood. This isn't talking about the flood for Noah's time, because it says here, you know, it says, in old time, the other side of the flood in old time, it's not talking about the flood that God put on the whole earth. It's just, the flood, flood is just another name for like a river. So he's talking about the Jordan River. And the reason why it's called a flood is because, one, well, it's a stream, the water's moving, right? It's flooding down, downstream. And then oftentimes you'll have it flood, overflow and kind of flood the areas around that during heavy watering times and stuff like that. So it's just an older word used to describe a river. And he's just saying on the other side of the river. I mean, remember, there was a big deal when they came into the promised land that they crossed the Jordan River and it was done through a miracle and things like that. And we see kind of a separation at the Jordan River from coming out of the wilderness of sin and stepping into the promised land. So it's very symbolic. There's a lot of meaning here. And that's why he's even highlighting it here again, just saying, you know, your fathers and, the, and Abraham's family and, and his dad, right, they worshiped other gods. When God called Abraham out and called him to go into that promised land and was leading him through the land of Canaan, he led him out from an unsaved family. His dad worshipped other gods. And that's the place he was in. And I'm not going to get into it tonight, but you can see when God called him out, you know, Abraham loved his family and his dad asked him to stay a little bit longer. Basically, he didn't leave right away. Now, he did end up leaving and his dad comes with him, but God called him out of that of that place and of that, uh, you know, even from his family to go and serve the Lord. And um, it may be, it seemed like a difficult thing, but when you look at the life of Abraham, look how blessed he was to step out in faith and to obey God's voice. And when God's telling him to go and do something, leaving, leaving behind family and friends and their religion and their, you know, everything else to go and serve the Lord. Um, <coughs> it's not always an easy decision to make, but uh, we can see Abraham's a great example of someone who is richly blessed. Uh, look at verse number three. It says, And I took your father Abraham from the other side of the flood and led him throughout all the land of Canaan and multiplied his seed and gave him Isaac. So God's explaining here what he did for Abraham. He says, I took him out of that land. I led him. And, and I want to point out and notice this as we read this chapter, God's involvement in everything that happens throughout this, this presentation of this history. And this is important because we don't ever want to forget that God does have involvement. Now, 
we're not Calvinists. We're going to get to that in a little bit. We don't believe that, that no one has a free will to choose what they do and what they don't do. But that being said, God does lead, he guides, he directs, he has a plan, and he, he, he has a way of making things happen the way that he wants them to happen. And oftentimes it's through using, lifting up or bringing down certain people. And uh, he, God knows the beginning from the end. He knows our thoughts. He knows everything, right? So sometimes it's difficult when you really try to, try to dig into it. And this is one of the flaws of Calvinists is that they, they think about it too hard. And, and in their human mind, they, they come up with a really flawed conclusion of, of essentially not having a free will. But it's, it's hard to understand a God that exists outside of time. It's hard to comprehend that because we're stuck in time. There is no time for God. I mean, yesterday is just as real as tomorrow for God as far as, as, far as the whole thing's concerned, the whole time frame. And, and it's all just on a, a plot. It's hard to imagine what it's like to exist out of time. We're stuck to that constraint. So um, I don't try to spend too much time you know, thinking about something that I won't be able to understand anyways. It is what it is. <coughs> and if God wanted us to really understand all the details about that, he'd tell us about it. So we're just going to go with what God gave us and just have faith in that. But anyways, I'm, I'm already kind of digressing here. My point is I, I'm, I'm trying to demonstrate, and what God's doing here is he's demonstrating all of his involvement. He says, I took your father Abraham from the other side of the flood. I led him throughout all the land of Canaan, and he did. I mean, you could see that in the story, that he called him out. He told him where to go. He was leading him. He was guiding him where he went. Abraham didn't know the plan, but God led him all the way. And he says here, it says, and multiplied his seed, which he did. And I love that it says here, he multiplied his seed first, and then he says, and gave him Isaac. Because the multiplication of the seed wasn't just one physical son and Isaac or two. It's not that the multiplication isn't, well, he had Ishmael and now he's got Isaac, so he's multiplied and has two. No. The multiplication of his seed are, are all of the, the descendants. Not, I, just, I believe it's not just of even through Isaac and through Israel. It's all the spiritual seed that, that <coughs> were a result of Abraham. You know, he's known as the father of faith. And, and, and because of his faith and his belief and his moving forward when God asks him to and God calls him out and him obeying God's command, uh, as a result, many people have their lives changed from, from Abraham, one person obeying and heeding God's command. And what an impact, that, that multiplication of that seed that just continues on for generations. It's pretty amazing. So, uh, but God, he says, he's like, I gave that to him. I gave him Isaac. And we don't forget, you know, God's the one that opens up the womb. We're going to see that here in the next verse. And I gave unto Isaac, Jacob, and Esau. Say, I gave, I gave him those children. I gave Abraham Isaac. I gave Isaac, Jacob, and Esau. I'm the one who's giving these people these things. And if you have children today, thank God that God's blessed you with children. Because God gave you those children. Things are no different today than they ever have been. God's the one that gives life. God's the one that forms and fashions every single one of us in the womb. Let's not forget that. We have a tendency in, in, this, in this world where you can't physically see God with your own two eyes to forget that He exists, to forget that He's an active part of your life. And we see a lot of reminders in this passage. Let's keep reading here. <coughs> Uh, and I gave, verse number four, and I gave unto Isaac, Jacob, and Esau, and I gave unto Esau Mount Seir to possess it. But Jacob and his children went down into Egypt. He's even giving Esau Mount Seir. Uh, verse number five, I sent Moses also and Aaron, and I plagued Egypt according to that which I did among them. And afterward, I brought you out. Who brought the children of Israel out of Egypt? God did. God led him there. And God brought them back out. God led Abraham through Canaan. He led uh, Israel to Egypt. He led the children of Israel, out, Moses and the children of Israel, out of Egypt. He's leading them the whole way, according to his plan. 
Verse number six, and I brought your fathers out of Egypt and ye came unto the sea and the Egyptians pursued after your fathers with chariots and horsemen under the Red Sea. And when they cried unto the Lord, he put darkness between you and the Egyptians and brought the sea upon them and covered them. And your eyes have seen what I have done in Egypt. And ye dwelt in the wilderness a long season. So he's continuing on. Let's keep going here. Verse number eight. And I brought you into the land of the Amorites, which dwelt on the other side, Jordan, and they fought with you. And I gave them into your hand that ye might possess their land. And I destroyed them from before you. So who's winning these victories? God is. Who gets the credit for it? God does. He's the one fighting for them. He's the one leading them. He's doing it for them. Now, we need to be reminded of this because it would be so easy for the children of Israel or anybody in their life when you get these victories, when you move on to blessed places or whatever it is to think, oh, I did this. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna, this is going to become a little bit more evident here in a few more verses. I don't want to skip too far ahead of myself. Let's keep reading here. Then Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, arose and warred against Israel and sent and called Balaam, the son of Beor, to curse you. But I would not hearken unto Balaam. Therefore, he blessed you still. So I delivered you out of his hand. Now, I couldn't remember when I was preparing for the sermon exactly what I went into, if I went into this passage or not. But a few weeks ago, we, I taught on um, Balaam. And that the fact that he's a false prophet. And this is, a, 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 if I didn't mention it then, I think I did. I'll just briefly summarize it here. This is one of the key uh, verses that we could turn to that demonstrates that Balaam was a false prophet. I mean, we know that from the New Testament, but um, oftentimes people get confused because when you read the story, he's not, he's like, well, I'm only going to do what God says to do, right? So you don't quite, it's not, it's not always as easy to understand why it is that he was such a bad person, a wicked person, false prophet. But we see here <coughs> the motivation of Balaam was to curse the children of Israel. That's what, he was, that's what he was hired to do. When the people showed up, he was being hired to curse Israel. And he was offered all kinds of stuff. And yeah, he declined it at first, but when he went in the morning, he didn't wait for, for them to come to him, which is what God told him to do. He just went and did it because he's thinking, well, I'll go get paid. And then, uh, but, and, and God's saying here, I didn't listen to him. <laughs> he wanted to curse. He's like, but I wouldn't listen to Balaam. And instead, he blessed you. He says, there, but I would not hearken to Balaam, verse 10, therefore. So because God wouldn't listen to him, he says, therefore, he blessed you still. So I delivered you out of his hand. There's God again interceding. And helping them out. Verse number 11. And you went over Jordan and came unto Jericho. And the men of Jericho fought against you. The Amorites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Girgashites, the Hivites and the Jebusites. And I delivered them into your hand. He lists all the inhabitants of the land. They, when they all came and fought against you, you've, all, you've had all these various battles. Guess who delivered you out of their hand? I did, saith the Lord. Verse number 12. And I sent the hornet before you, which drave them out from before you, even the two kings of the Amorites, but not with thy sword, nor with thy bow. And this is a part where I, I think it's really interesting because the hornet here being mentioned is only mentioned three times in the Bible. It's mentioned in Deuteronomy and in... Um, I want to say like Numbers this story about them going forth to battle and here. This is the third place. So it's not something that you necessarily like. I mean, how many of you remember from these stories where God is sending the children of Israel into the promised land? Remember the hornets going and defeating the people before them? Probably not because it's not mentioned very much at all. You read a lot about the battles. You read a lot about all the different things that were going on. And, you know, when the, the children of Israel came to Jericho and they, they circled the city and all this stuff, right? But we don't see or don't remember as much about something like this. But, you know, I believe this to be true. It's right there in the scripture. He says, I sent the hornet before you, which drave them out from before you. Look at this. Even the two kings of the Amorites, remember Og, the king of Bashan? Before the, but this is what, when Moses was leading the battles, before they crossed into uh, the promised land, those two kings of the Amorites. 
God sent the hornet before them even to defeat these people. You don't see the references to that all throughout those, when the story really goes into a lot of detail. But there's a few brief mentions of that throughout Scripture, and God's highlighting that here. Because when you have these great victories, and yeah, you're putting forth an effort, you're going in and doing this. He says, don't forget. Don't forget. I, and, and you know what? They, they probably didn't even see the hornets go before them and plague the, the, the people of the land because they still did have to have a battle. But he says, I, I sent them in. I did that. I was driving them out from before you. <coughs> I sent the hornet before you, which drove them out from before you, even the two kings of the Amorites, but not with thy sword nor with thy bow. He's saying, don't rely on your own. It wasn't your own strength. It wasn't you that did all this stuff, it was me. He's really driving home this point. One of the reasons I think is because they finally finished their battle. See, when you're in the middle of, of struggles and battles and fights and stuff, it's a lot easier to rely on God because you know you need him. I mean, you're, you're, you're fighting all the time. You need, you need that strength. You need that encouragement. You need to be lifted up a little bit more. And it's, it's a lot, you know, just like, um, that's one of the reasons why it's so much more receptive to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ in poorer neighborhoods. Because people are struggling more. People are struggling financially. People are struggling in other ways. And, and they're, they're just trying to get by. So they're more humble. Because they're, they're, it's a lot easier to, to receive a gift when you're real humble. It's a lot easier to put your trust in Jesus Christ and to put it, you say, yes, God, I can't do this on my own. I know I can't do this on my own. I'm having a hard enough time just getting by. God, I need you. They're in a much better frame of mind and of humility to be able to receive that. But when you start accumulating riches, maybe you start being blessed and you start getting a lot of things, what happens? People have a tendency to think, oh, I did all this. Look at the works of my hands. Nebuchadnezzar is a great example of that. Look at this great kingdom which I built. Did he build that kingdom? No. God said, I raised him up. I put you in that position for his purpose. And he says, you know what? I'm going to bring you down. And he did. He turned him into like an animal, a beast. Just to show who's the real boss. And we need to never, ever lose sight of that. No matter where you're at. The children of Israel are here. I believe they're getting all of this information right now and they're trying to hammer it home. Because now they're going to experience a time of peace and prosperity. They're in the promised land. Their enemies are defeated. They don't have these struggles anymore. He said, don't forget where you came from. Going all the way back to Abraham. And don't forget that God is the one who got you here. He led every step of the way and he defeated the enemies. And it's only by his grace and mercy that you're here today. That's what he's telling them. Verse number 13. And I have given you a land for which ye did not labor. You say, but didn't they fight and do battles? Yeah, but he's, you know, he's telling them though, he's still saying, you didn't, you didn't work for this land. And cities which ye built not, and ye dwell in them of the vineyards and olive yards which ye planted not do ye eat. So basically they were brought into this land it's already been established. Other people came and settled and built the buildings and built, you know, got all the farmlands good to go. And these people got everything ready for them. And God's saying, I, and, I, and I delivered them in your hand. The reason why you won these battles is because of me. And I'm giving you all of this as an inheritance. And this is also um, a, a good sim symbolism of what's going to happen to us when, you know, as believers the inheritance that we have. Jesus said that he, he goes to prepare a place for you, right? And um, he said, in my father's house are many mansions. So when we enter the promised land in that new Jerusalem that's going to come down from heaven, that's all going to be built already. That city is ready to go. It's prepared. It's ready to go for us. Uh, the Similarly, the way that the children of Israel received all of this land and property and things and houses and all this stuff. Um, and what a, what a great, uh, 
<laughs> what a great thought. What, a, what, a, what an awesome thing to just, to just think about that God has done that for us. And there's no way anyone's going to ever be thinking that, oh, I'm in this mansion because I was so good on the earth <laughs> when you get to heaven. I know no one's going to be thinking that because you're not going to have this sinful flesh that's going to even prompt that type of pride. But, um, man, what a, what a great day that's going to be. That's exciting. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 14. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth. And put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord. So verses 1 through 13 all show how much God has done. This whole first half of the chapter is just all outlining what God has done. And he says, for this reason, now therefore, fear the Lord. Why wouldn't you fear the Lord? He's the one who did everything for you. You ought to fear the Lord. <clears throat> and serve him in sincerity and in truth. God doesn't want a bunch of phonies worshiping him. God's not impressed by the people who show up to church on Sunday morning and they put on all the fancy clothes and they start talking spiritual talk just to sound real good and to fit in and to check off their box or to make other people think they're such a great person. God doesn't care about you. When you. If that's your reason you're coming here, that's not what he wants. God wants you to serve him and serve you in sincerity. It means it's real. It's genuine. You actually do care about the things of God. You do care about his word. You really, it really means something to you. He says, and in truth. Sincerity and truth. This should define every single church member that we have here and how we serve the Lord. That's the type of church that I want to be a part of. Because you know what? That shows. That rubs off on other people. When you see someone who's sincere in their beliefs, you see someone who says, wow, they don't just claim to be this Christian and, and say, oh, God bless you, or to say whatever, and that all of a sudden is going to make them some, some Christian. No, these people actually care and are out doing something. They're actually living life different from everybody else because they're trying to follow the Bible. They actually care about people, like for real. Not just to be seen of other people. But that's the best testimony. When you're out doing something good, you're out serving God, and you don't even know other people are watching and someone sees that. That, that speaks volumes. Why? Because when you're doing it in sincerity and truth, you don't care who else is watching, but you know what? That's going to end up doing even more good when, when people can witness that. Other people. Unbelievers, other just, just people out in the world see you going out and doing a good thing. It does make an impact. It makes a difference. I'm sure many of you have similar experiences, even just going out soul winning, where people, you knock on their door, an unsaved person, right? But what do they do? They're all the time like, man, I, you know what? I'm going to give you credit for going out and doing this. Now, look, we're not doing it to go and get credit. We know that, right? That's, that's not the point. We're not trying to make ourselves look good in that person's eyes. The reason why I'm bringing it up, though, is because that oftentimes does have an impact on these people, and they're going to be way more inclined to actually listen to what you have to say than the phony that they know real well, you know, says one thing. Oh, yeah, they go to church every week, but you should see them on Saturday. You should see them on Monday. You should see them on any other day of the week. Because they're just a hypocrite. God doesn't want a bunch of hypocrites. And I know to some degree everybody's a hypocrite. <coughs> but that's not what we're talking about here. We're not talking about the, the fact that we're all sinners to some degree. It's how we serve the Lord. It ought to be in sincerity and in truth. Verse number 15. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And what a powerful verse this is. What a powerful verse that is. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. There's so many things that we could glean from this. First of all, this is where I said, don't worry, we're going to get back to it, the Calvinism thing. We're not Calvinist. 
And when I say that we're not Calvinists, I know there's a lot involved in Calvinism. There's a lot of heresy involved in their teachings. But the primary thing that I want to focus on is the fact that we do have free will. If we don't have the ability to choose, if we don't have the will, will is what you want, a, a choice to make, then how is it that this would even make sense where Joshua says through the Holy Ghost, choose you this day whom you will serve, whom ye will serve. What's your will? Who do you want to serve? Go ahead and serve them. If you don't have a will, then it would be God's will that people choose to serve other gods. Let me say it again, so as you understand. If, if you don't have a will, I mean, it's not your choice, but it's just God's controlling everything like a, a great puppet master and you're on his string, then the people who go off and serve other gods, even after hearing about Jesus Christ, even after hearing about the Bible, it would mean that, well, I mean, they don't really have a will, so then it must be God's will because who else is doing it? But the Bible says that the Lord's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. We know what God's will is. And if God's will is that nobody would go to hell, everybody would be saved. But we know that that's not the case, that there are people going to hell and there are people that aren't saved. <coughs> the only way to reconcile is to say, well, then people must have a will. It's the bottom line. Choose you this day whom you will serve. And there comes a point everybody needs to make that decision. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. And we need to make sure we're doing a good job of presenting that at the door too and get, uh, trying to drive people to make that decision. Joshua's doing that here. He tells them the history. He tells them the story. He tells them how they got to where they're at. Now the choice is up to you. And when we preach the gospel, one thing, I'm not saying anyone's not doing this already, but just don't forget this. We're, we're, we're giving people the information about who Jesus was, about who we are. We're sinners, right? Who Jesus is. Who did he, what did he do for us? Give them the whole plan. Tell them everything. But then we got to nail it down to be like, look, you need to make a decision on this. You need to decide. I know what I believe. But what do you believe? <coughs> don't just put it off. Joshua was demanding of these people, hey, choose you. He didn't say choose you whenever you want. He said, choose you this day. You make the choice today. You've heard the truth. You've seen the examples. Here we are today. Make the decision. Choose. What are you going to choose? Are you going to choose life and the Lord? Or are you going to choose these, these idols and these false gods and the, the pleasures of this world and wickedness and death and hell. Make the choice. It's up to you because God's not going to make the choice for you. You choose whom you will serve. Now, another thing I like about what, what Joshua says here, he then follows it up and finishes it saying, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. This is the type of leadership. Remember, I just preached maybe a week or two ago on, on leadership and, and being strong and how important that is. And I'm going to focus mostly on fathers right now and husbands because it is important for men in today's society to be strong leaders at home. Joshua didn't say, but as for me in my house... Whatever my wife decides is what we're going to do. He's speaking not just for me. He's speaking for everybody in his household. And he's saying, it's not enough to say, well, I'm going to do this and everyone else can just do what they want. My daughters, my sons, my, my wife, they're all going to do what they want, but I'm going to go and do this. That's not what Joshua said. He said, as for me and my house, he said, we will serve the Lord. And dads, husbands, you are given that responsibility along with the authority. It's not enough to just have the authority. It's authority and responsibility. It's your job to lead the house. And maybe you haven't naturally been 
much of a leader. That's why we're going through and preaching on the leadership stuff, so you could get to be a better leader and change. If you haven't been that good at dealing with your household, then change. Get better. It's your job to be the leader, to instruct your family and say, I don't care if we've been doing things a certain way for the past 10 years or 20 years or 30 years or two years or whatever, whatever's been going on in the house, if it's wicked and it's wrong, you say, you know what? Today I'm making a decision and as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And you know what? We're getting rid of all the worldly gar garbage. The worldly garbage is going out the window. It's going out the door. And dad, you need to have a backbone enough to say, if you, if you believe something's wicked, you believe something's a sin, you think that, I, oh man, I don't like the fact that my family's, you know, sitting around and watching all this Hollywood crap on the TV, and I don't like the music they're listening to, guess what, dad, it's your responsibility to go and take that TV if you have to, and chuck it out the window. Throw it in the garbage can. Don't be afraid to take your kid's stuff and just destroy it and get rid of it. It's your job to do that. Now, you take whatever means necessary is what you need to do, but you need to lead your house. Take control. That's what Joshua did. As for me and my house, he said, you know what? Me, my family, we're all going to church. We're all serving the Lord. And as long as kids are underneath the authority in their parents' house, as long as you live in that house, you're under your parents' authority. You need to do what they say. Ten Commandments. It's found right there. Honor your father and mother. And kids need to obey their father and mother. This is so important, especially in today's society. So many problems as a result of, of an improper, imbalanced authority structure in the house. Don't be afraid of what of how your family is going to react when you're doing what's right. If things have been done a certain way for a while, I understand the kids are going to get upset or maybe the wife's going to get upset or whatever. But that's why you know, it's, I, that's one of the reasons why I believe it's we given to the man because a man ought to not let emotions rule him and have to make the hard decisions, the hard choices of what's right for the family. It's not easy. I'm not saying it's easy, but it's what, it's what needs to be done. I just recently had to make a very important decision for my family. And I'm not going to go into the details about it, but it's one of those things that you don't really want to do. It's a decision you didn't really want to have to even face. But you know what? I saw a problem and something that needed to be fixed and I got to make the hard choice. And I'm not saying that my wife was in sin or my kids were in sin or anything like that. It's nothing like that. It's not some major thing that was going wrong. But it's just a decision I didn't want to have to make. But you know what? As the head of the household, you got to make the tough decision sometimes. Sometimes you just have to say, nope, we can't have this anymore. We can't do this anymore. This has to go. It's causing too many problems. Gone. It is what it is. And you make the decisions for the betterment of your entire household. You know what's right. You ought to know what's right. If you don't know what's right, get, get in the Bible. Read, figure out what's right and then make right choices. You're responsible for your family. Joshua didn't back down at all. I mean, it, of course he had his family in order. He was a great leader. The same thing is said about Abraham. Because I know, I know Abraham. God said this about Abraham. I know that his house is going to follow him after that, that he's going to raise his children. He's going to raise his household to follow the Lord. I know that. He ruled his house well. Joshua ruled his house well. And every husband, father needs to rule their house well. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 16. The Bible says, And the people answered and said, God forbid that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. So this is their response. <laughs> God forbid. You know, we're not going to go and serve other gods. Of course we're going to serve the Lord. Verse 17. For the Lord our God, he it is that brought us up and our fathers out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. 
and which did those great signs in our sight and preserved us in all the way wherein we went and among all the people through whom we passed. And the Lord drave out from before us all the people, even the Amorites which dwelt in the land. Therefore will we also serve the Lord, for he is our God. So they keep on reiterating here now, well, look, God's the one who did all this for us. So they have the right attitude. They have the right heart. They're saying, look, God did all this stuff for us. We're not going to go and serve anyone else. Verse number 19. And Joshua said unto the people, You cannot serve the Lord, for he is an holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. If ye forsake the Lord and serve strange gods, then he will turn and do you hurt and consume you. After that, he hath done you good. And this is another thing that we need to <coughs> always keep our balance on, on who God is. Because God does have long suffering and mercy. And a lot of it. A tremendous amount of it. But don't ever let that get you to the point where you forget the judgment of God either. And that's, that's what he's telling people. God just did all these great things for us. Of course we're going to serve him. That's what they're saying, right? Well, he's, he's been so good to us. Of course we're going to, in turn, serve him. And he says, you can't serve him. He's a holy God. He's a righteous God. You think you're going to serve him? He says, if you forsake the Lord and you go and, and, and go off and start serving these other strange gods, he says, then he's going to turn and do you hurt and consume you. After that, he had done you good. So even though he's already done you good, don't take for granted if you just turn your back on him and you just go off and he says, you know what, he's going he's to turn right back around and he's going to punish you and he's going to consume you and he's going to destroy you. Don't think that he won't. And we can't get flippant in our attitudes about, well, I'm saved. I've got you know, eternal life, so I'm just going to go and do whatever I want. You better not have that attitude because <laughs> God will judge you. Maybe not in a lake of fire, definitely not in a lake of fire. But he's still going to come back and bring judgment down on you. He, do, he does that with his people. <coughs> judgment begins in the house of God. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 21. And the people said unto Joshua, Nay, but we will serve the Lord. So they read it right again and say, No, no, we're going to do this. And Joshua said unto the people, Ye are witnesses against yourselves that ye have chosen you the Lord to serve him. And they said, We are witnesses. Now therefore put away, said he, the strange gods which are among you, and incline your heart unto the Lord God of Israel. And the people said unto Joshua, The Lord our God will we serve, and his voice will we obey. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and set them a statute and an ordinance in Shechem. So there, you know, he says, choose you this day. He makes them make a decision. And they're, they're saying no over and over again, no, no, we're going to serve the Lord. He's our God. That's who we want to serve. We are serving the Lord. He says, okay. And then that day, he's making an ordinance and a statute among them, basically saying that you're committing to serve God. That's what you're going to do. That's the decision you've made. And now you're going to stick to it and he's going to hold them to it. Verse number 25, or verse 26, excuse me. And Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God and took a great stone and set it up there under an oak that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. So now he's setting up this marker, kind of like we've seen this in the past at other, at other very significant places throughout the whole journey and life of the children of Israel. You know, they, see, they set up these pillar of stones in, in multiple areas, right? With great victories and, and you know, other things going on. And now he's saying, okay, this is the decision point. You've decided to, to choose the Lord as your God today and we've made this covenant. So now he's establishing and setting up this rock just so it, it's, this, it's this physical reminder that they could see literally with their eyes and be like, Everyone knows, and he, that's why he's making a big point of it. There's nothing special about the rock, other than it's probably just some big rock, and he's setting it up in a place, so that way, anytime you pass by that way, you're going to remember, oh yeah, what does this mean? Yeah, this is, this is the place where we chose the Lord as our, as our God. That's what that means. That's the reference for that. And, uh, you know, it helps us as people to, to have those reminders, because you can get so caught up in everything else that you need, you need to sometimes physically be like, oh yeah, we did make this decision. Verse 27, And Joshua said unto all the people, Behold, this stone shall be witness, a witness unto us, for it hath heard all the words of the Lord which he spake unto us. 
It shall be therefore a witness unto you, lest ye deny your God. So he's saying this is going to be that witness, right? Like this was here when we made this agreement, this covenant. So here it is. And I just want to just real quickly um, point out a folly in how some people interpret the Bible. Because <coughs> there seems to be a lot of emphasis on saying, well, we take the Bible literally. And you know what? I put an emphasis on that oftentimes too, especially when we're out sowing or talking to other people and trying to explain about the church and what we believe. The reason why we say that is because there's so many people who just go off the deep end and try to explain away everything the Bible says when it just says something real clear and black and white, right? That's why we say that. But on the other hand, nowadays you've got people, and this has probably been around forever too, that want to say, oh, no, we really take the Bible literally. You don't take it literally. We really take it literally. And that's where you get all this flat earth nonsense and things like that where people are like, I mean, literally, no, the earth stood still and you start looking at this stuff. Well, if you, if you interpreted every single phrase in the Bible that way, literally, then that would mean like this stone literally heard everything that was said. Well, does, this, does a stone have ears? Does the stone have life? Like this stone here, it's not hearing anything. I mean, oh, but I take the Bible literally. That's nonsense. We understand what that means. It actually has meaning when it, the Bible says that, and it's using language and speech. That, does anyone have a problem understanding what it means when it says that the, the, the stone is a witness? That it, you know, of course not. It was just something that was there that he's saying, hey, let's, let's make this a reminder for us, right? That's all it is. It doesn't mean you're not taking the Bible literally for what it says. It means you're using common sense and understanding. And that's where the reason I just bring this up is just because there's so many, and there's many other areas where people do the same thing. Don't get so caught up in this nonsense of getting a microscope out onto these words and, and trying to make the general meaning and understanding of it different than just what it says. It's, it's not that difficult, but people have a tendency to make things more difficult because they want to zoom in. And that's, that's exactly what I was saying about the Calvinists too. They, they try to zoom in too, too deep into things they don't even understand and they come up with all this weird false doctrine. And they try to logic their way into all these things and they just, not that there's no logic in the Word of God, there's plenty of logic, but they, they rely more on their logic and understanding than they do on the Word of God. But the Bible's logical. Everything makes perfect sense. But it's, it's just like the, the science falsely so-called. They, they have a tendency, people who believe in science falsely so-called will tell you that they believe in logic too. But it's just a bad logic. Anyways, let's keep reading here. I digress. We're almost done. Verse number 28. So Joshua let the people depart, every man unto his inheritance. And it came to pass after these things that Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being 110 years old. And they buried him in the border of his inheritance in timnath Sirah, which is in Mount Ephraim, on the north side of the hill of Gaash. And Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that overlived Joshua and which had known all the works of the Lord that he had done for Israel. And the bones of Joseph, which the children of Israel brought up out of Egypt, buried they in Shechem in a parcel of ground, which Jacob bought of the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem, for a hundred pieces of silver, and it became the inheritance of the children of Joseph. And Eleazar, the son of Aaron, died, and they buried him in a hill that pertained to Phinehas, his son, which was given him in Mount Ephraim. So we see three um, major players, major you know, men of God that were, that were doing a lot of good things. We see Joshua. Of course, Joseph had died much earlier, but then we see Eleazar, also Aaron's son. All of these great you know, pillars of the faith are being laid to rest. You know, their time has moved on. Great leaders of the faith, they've moved on, but to demonstrate the importance of having good, solid leaders. The Bible's saying, yeah, you know what? As long as these guys were around, children of Israel did pretty good. They obeyed the word of God. They, were, you know, they had a good heart. They were serving them. 
the way they ought to be serving them. And then not just with, it wasn't just Joshua. There are other people who were great leaders at that time too. And they, these older guys, they were around to see the works of the Lord and they really kept things in order and in line and people listened to them and gave them respect. But then what happens? These people die off and there's no real strong leaders that have been raised up to carry that torch and continue moving forward. And that is the last point I'm going to close on is, is how important it really is not only to lead and, you know, and, and live your life the best you can and serve God to the utmost as far as the, the works and the actions that you do, but to be able to commit what you've learned, what you know, what you do, especially as a leader, unto the next generation and take the time and spend the time with the youth to get them prepared because they're going to have battles. They're going to need to continue moving forward. If we don't invest the time, you can be the best leader in the world. If you don't invest the time, then it's just going to end with you. Not to take anything away from any great man of God, but God can use anybody that's willing. And no matter how much God has used you, don't get a, a puffed up attitude thinking it's all because of you. Like, like Joshua could just be like, well, it's all because of me that all these people did, you know. No. God could use anybody. Invest the time to try to, to train up the next generation, the next people to continue to lead. And I'm not saying Joshua didn't do that, but what we see here is that these people do start to die, and then we're going to get into next week, we're going we're to get into Judges. So we're going to continue this transition. This is a great transition where it's saying, okay, you know, this person died, this person died, this person died, and those are kind of like these great pillars of faith. And then we're going to see a lot of things going on back and forth through the book of Judges, through the, you know, people going away from God, coming back to God, going away from God, coming back to God, all kind of dependent on these leaders that God raises up. And we need to do our best to try to teach people to become leaders and not just to get relaxed thinking that everything's okay and you're enjoying peace and prosperity because your, your, your fathers won all these great battles. That's kind of, the, that's kind of where um, Rehoboam, his great downfall was. Because you had David, David fought a lot of battles. Solomon was there for the battles. Solomon saw all the battles that his dad fought. And, and had more appreciation, understanding of that. But then Solomon was blessed with great riches and stuff. But then when it's time for his son, Rehoboam, to take the throne, he had the spoiled brat type of an attitude and saying, oh, we don't, what do we need to listen to the wisdom of these guys? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to listen to all my buddies that grew up with me in, with a silver spoon in our mouths and had everything handed to us. And we're going to be these real hard guys and, and, and come down hard on the children of Israel and had no wisdom whatsoever. We need to take the time and invest them in the children and make sure we're training up a, a, good, a good group of people continuing forward as long as we can. And, and, and teach them the importance of, te of bringing up leaders so that doesn't get forgotten. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much <coughs> for this great book of the Bible, the book of Joshua, Lord, and all of the, the, the things that we can learn from this book. There's so much there. There's so much great truths, Lord. We barely even scratch the surface through this entire series that we've been going through every Wednesday night. God, I ask that you please just help us as we study your word. Help us to understand even more. Lord, help us to be strong, especially the men, to be strong leaders in the home. And I pray that you would please um, bless our church. And we're here because we love you, God, and we, just, we need your, your direction, your guidance. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.